Descartes' images of the eye and his dioptrique come after a 150 uh, year period of development in visual representation in print. Um, and I will just um, focus on just two woodcuts uh, produced nine times in total in uh, the work. Uh, but these form the basis for the insertion of the eye into many different contexts. Um, you see here. Um, so um, where Descartes getting, getting this image of the eye and, and what it's able to do um, um, is, is sort of the, the background um, that I'm going to provide here. Um, so I, I'm identifying three main uh, traditions. Um, first is the perspectiva or pre-modern optics, the science of sight stemming from Ibn al-Haytham, and then also uh, the development of that tradition with Kepler. Um, the textbook philosophical tradition, um, primarily um, Gregor Reich's uh, Margarita Philosophica, um, and then uh, the anatomical tradition stemming from Vesalius. Um, there were no images of the eye in the anatomical tradition proper prior to Vesalius. Um, so the development of, of this with Vesalius, then Felix Platter and Fabrique Zabaco Pendente um, will be the next um, tradition. So um, Peckham's uh, Perspectiva Communis um, was first printed in 1482. And um, there's this one particular set of images of the eye um, that was uh, reproduced in at least five more editions throughout the 17th century, or 16th century, sorry. Um, so the eye in the Perspectiva tradition was described in the text as having very specific geometrical features and key to this was that the centers of the cornea and the anterior uh, of the crystalline humor or lens were supposed to coincide and the incoming rays perpendicular to the uh, cornea uh, are also supposed to be perpendicular to the surface of the crystalline humor. So in this tradition stemming from Ibn al-Haytham, a geometrical eye was constructed a priori to satisfy the demands of an intromission theory of vision. So this eye does not come from anatomy proper. Um, and here we see in, in these um, diagrams, a uh, representation of the centers of various parts of the eye. And we notice that the cornea and the anterior of the crystalline humor are in the same, uh, in the same point. Um, so uh, one thing that we see in uh, the manuscript tradition from which this, uh, this text derives is um, a certain indifference to, um, indifference to exact geometrical uh, representation of the text. But uh, interestingly, in the move to print, a lot of this indifference was resolved and you get a very quite nice textual representation uh, or a visual representation of these textual features. So here we have indeed uh, centers of the various parts of the eye, the cornea and the, um, the anterior of the crystalline humor do indeed coincide uh, in, the, in the image itself. If we compare this to a typical manuscript image, they clearly don't. So mm -hmm. diagrams in the medieval manuscripts were geometrical in the sense of being drawn with a compass and straight edge, but these manuscripts show a great deal in difference to the exact representation of these geometrical features. The eye here was primarily to um, use to identify the names of the parts and to give their nested order and the order along the visual axis of the humors and, and tunics and with, through which um, a ray would pass through. Um, so what you get then with the print tradition is the expectation of a text image alignment being introduced, um, both to readers and producers of images within optics. Um, so if we move to Gregor Reich's Margarita Philosophica, um, enormously popular uh, textbook, liberal, liberal arts textbook, um, published throughout the 16th and 17th centuries. Um, there's a huge number of illustrations in the book. And one thing that, you, that 
you get in this textbook tradition is the expectation that images accompanying texts will occur opposite the text, even if one needs to re reproduce the image multiple times, a strategy that we certainly see with Descartes um, and Descartes' works throughout. Um, and um, this eye has a unique feature, which is this sort of, um, it's called a, maybe a pine cone shape or a, um, uh, looks like a Hershey's kiss uh, shaped crystalline humor. And this makes its way outside of this context. And here we see it in an anatomical work and then reproduced later in, in, in another work. Um, sorry, I skipped by that. Um, so this image traveled around quite a bit and, and, and was present in a lot of different contexts. Um, but um, clearly there's no um, sense of um, anatomical accuracy in, in the sense that um, uh, people like you, like you will see in, in Vesalius. Um, what you get again is the, the naming of the parts were, was very important. Um, their nested order, um, the connection between the humors and the tunics and the parts of the brain and the ventricles of the brain, the other, the, the other parts of the brain through the optic nerve and so on and so forth. Not so much a uh, representation of any spatial features, uh, these no, um, more and more topological features. Um, so with Vesalius, um, what we have is uh, the first printed image of the interior of the eye that claims to depict the relative shapes and sizes of the parts exactly as they exist in nature. Um, and there was no uh, visual tradition within anatomy uh, that represented the eye that, uh, that Vesalius was drawing upon. So this is, is quite new. And Vesalius was taking more from the, um, the optical tradition. And certainly he, he was familiar with Reich's uh, Margarita and heavily criticized a lot of the images that he found in there. Um, so he's taking from these traditions and transforming it in an important way. So we have two eyes, two um, pages in which we see these eyes. Um, the first is what I call the cosmic eye. Uh, he says, and this is how we are accustomed to depict the heavens and the four elements in a plane. So he's also seemingly drawing from a um, astronomical visual tradition as well. And he says that he draws this eye before he dissects in the schools um, in order to bring order to this very messy, um, messy dissection with fluid parts and, and very tough uh, membranes and so on and so forth. So um, yeah, this, this image is, is reminiscent of uh, astronomical diagrams, but also transformation of the visual traditions that came before. Um, and and you, what you get um, is a, an interesting possibility um, after uh, Vesalius, um, which is, um, which we'll see in a little bit. But um, what we can say about this, um, this is the second set of images, which I call assembly instructions for a divine craftsman. Um, you would never see these parts as they were dissected in such a way, a lot of these are fluid. So what you get is this uh, ideal eye in the sense that it is not uh, at all diseased or, or abnormal. It's universal. It's not of a particular dissection. Um, it's living in the sense that it is infused with visual spirit, but it also claims to represent measurable spatial properties revealed through firsthand experience. But interestingly, not as we ourselves could experience them. It's an, it's a, an idealized living eye in the sense. And Vesalius does not, also does not um, advocate a theory of vision. So his illustration does not support any particular theory of vision explicitly in the text. He says this, um, that he has not decided on, he has not determined how vision works. So this, uh, the, these images of the eye really become the default representation in anatomy, but also in many other contexts. But in anatomy, uh, in, in particular, um, you see this new capacity for visual images uh, or for, for visual representations of the eye, which is that um, it allows for a visual commentary and criticism of one's anatomical predecessors, in particular Vesalius. Here we have in Valverde, 
um, in the text, um, it, it, uh, Vesalius is somewhat criticized um, and the location of the crystalline humor is moved up from the center of the eye, both in the text and in the image. But then in Felix Plater, you get a um, changing of the shape of the crystalline humor, which is not remarked upon in the text that it is indeed a criticism of uh, uh, people that came before him, of anatomists that came before him. So it's just um, this sort of criticism is, is in a sense purely visual. And this commentary, this, this adjustment is purely visual uh, in a certain sense. And then when Johannes Kepler took or uh, copied Felix Plater's images for his um, really revolutionary um, work on, on optics, um, you see that uh, Kepler had added the cor his corneal bulge, which was not present in his original images. So again, a visual commentary and correction of um, his predecessors. And um, yeah, one important, um, so this is a really important legacy of Vesalius's, um, um, Vesalius's images, uh, specifically with reference to the, um, to images of the eye. So recently, Daniel Margosi has uh, written a, a nice piece um, criticizing Ivan's and Latour's account of this sort of idea of exact reproducibility or um, this immobile, immobile uh, mobiles uh, idea. Um, and he writes that, um, oops, uh, that uh, medical authors and publishers provided improved and corrected copies of the woodcuts, but only to a lesser degree, partly because readers were not familiar with the interpretation of images and partly because it was highly labor intensive to modify illustrations. Um, but I argue that this is not the case for the uh, images of the eye, um, partly because there was this prior uh, visual tradition that they were easier to read in a certain sense than some of the other anatomical images, um, they were more easily uh, corrected, um, or more readily corrected than some, perhaps some of the other, other images. Um, and also just a note that the, this Vesalian eye has escaped its context quite readily. And we see this uh, uh, all the way up through the middle of the 17th century, where this Vesalian eye has been overlaid with, with another perhaps Cartesian influenced eye um, in Hobbes's uh, manuscript on optics. So um, finally moving to uh, Fabricius of Aquapendente, who was the most um, famous anatomist in Europe at the time and uh, chair in anatomy of surgery at the University of Padua, teacher of William Harvey. He advocated a very um, quite well uh, worked out uh, galeno aristotelian method of investigating nature, which we see here. Um, it says first, uh, he'll reveal the entire fabric and structure of the eye, proceed to the action of the eye, that is to vision itself, and then to contemplate the uses, uh, utilitates of the eye, not only according to the eye as the whole, but also the individual parts of the eye themselves. But that you hunt all these things through dissection. Um, and um, this is very important that, um, Starting with uh, dissection, um, you move on to the other um, the other parts of this sort of Galenic method or, or, or structuring of, of your treatise, Historia, Actio, and Usus, or Utilitas. Um, but starting with, with dissection, this dissectio um, stage, um, that he talks about, um, which is a, he, in textually it's, rep, it, it's given um, some, some space, which is primarily how to dissect the eye instructions about how to dissect the eye. But the images, uh, these, he has two sets of images and this first set of images in his treatise on vision really are about the experience of dissecting itself and, uh, um, bringing the reader to an understanding of how to dissect the eye and um, and what you ought to be looking for. So I'm going to go briefly through this. Here we have the retina 
um, which we're supposed to see and immediately recognize as being a part of the brain or being the same substance as the brain itself, um, and so on and so forth. Um, so these are really um, instructions on how to dissect. And also, interestingly, there are particulars. Um, here we have two different representations of the same eye um, or the same same kind of eye dissected in, in pretty much the same way, but there are two uh, sort of particular representations rather than a universal representation. Um, and we see the a tear occurring in uh, showing the vitreous humor in both. Um, so that's one set of representations of the eye. The other occur um, in his last section on usus u utilitas, which gives the final uh, the purpose or final cause of the part, uh, what the part, um, how the parts contribute to vision as a whole and what vision contributes to the life of the animal. Um, and you get at the end or at, in this section, um, these very interesting mathematical diagrams. Um, and this is done in a very sort of Aristotelian fashion with the uh, shapes and figures shown with the matter abstracted away after a long experience with dissection. Um, and um, he writes that um, this I, and indeed this diagram should be the basis for, um, for um, the basis for a new sort of mathematical optics, but also a challenge to the medieval um, um, perspectivist tradition. He explicitly wants it to be a challenge to the, the perspectivist tradition. Um, and here we see the um, centers of the parts very distinct, especially the cornea and the um, anterior of the crystalline humor uh, being out of, uh, uh, out of center, which uh, is a challenge, explicitly a challenge to this um, perspectivist tradition, but it's a visual challenge. Um, so we get this by this movement of one point into two. Um, and here's uh, sort of what Fabricius is in a sense asking his reader to do, figure out an account of, of how this works. Um, and he has the rays crossing in the eye rather than coming uh, into a, um, a single sort of um, visual cone. The cone is dispersed in the back of the eye. Um, we see this fo followed exactly in, um, uh, Aguilonius's optics in 1613. You also see the same bifurcation of these two images, one to show the parts and the, the structures and, and so on and so forth, this sort of dissection, what you would see in a dissection, then another separate mathematical uh, image uh, based on that, uh, that dissection, um, but properly understood as, as a mathematical in the Aristotelian sense as, as the matter abstracted away. So um, what do we see uh, with Descartes? Um, well, we see an, an interestingly these same features of the eye that um, we saw in Fabricius and which were derived from this optical tradition, this perspectivist tradition, um, but it, these um, points, uh, which here are out of sync as they are in, in the tradition preceding it, are really purely vestigial. This, these points are never mentioned in this section of the text. His first, this first eye was, is really about the anatomy of the eye. And so much of that information, uh, Descartes says, he omits all these details. And even though this image has these, these mathematical features, they are not referenced in this in this uh, part of the, the treatise. Um, so it's perhaps this uh, I was going to be used for a different purpose, but then um, in this, in the, in the, the dap treat, um, these mathematical features are in a sense vestigial at this point in the text. Um, but then this second uh, really famous um, camera obscura I um, is then deployed in a, an interesting way, um, it has it's used in a sense in a mathematical, but only in a as a, in a sort of mathematical rhetorical way, 
Uh, there's no actual mathematics being done here. Um, it's a description of an experiment, a how-to. It is a sort of virtual witnessing. Um, it's an occasion for philosophical rumination in important ways. Um, so we can see that uh, Descartes is drawing on many of the new capacities that were developed over uh, say 150 years in print, new capacities for these images of the eye, picking and choosing uh, and combining them in an interesting way. Here's just a summary of all of the things that have gone on before. Um, so you do see in a certain sense, drawing on this Vesalian tradition, uh, drawing on what we saw in Fabricius and Aguilonius, following Fabricius, but then um, only taking certain uh, aspects of them. Um, what you see, this bifurcation that you saw at the end of the anatomical tradition is now recombined into a single image, um, once again, discarding this Galeno Aristotelian um, method of investigation. But then this eye, once this anatomical eye is just then thrown into uh, a context showing this retinal theory of vision. And then um, that is again sort of thrown into many other different contexts at the end.